So Michael Chabon, the book Telegraph Avenue is set in 2004, but its preoccupations of the music and the black exploitation films, they seem to belong to an earlier era. So why set the book when you did? Well, because I, I wanted to write about life now, more or less now, uh, in the present day. I hadn't set a novel in the present day, or in the more or less the present day, since my second novel, Wonder Boys, which I published in 1995 and I wrote in 93, 94. So by 2007, when I started working on this book, it had already been a very long time since I had addressed more or less contemporary reality, quote unquote, contemporary experience. And um, you know, I didn't want to write another novel set in some earlier time period. I, I wanted to just be able to walk outside my front door and do research by going to the grocery store. Or a record store. In or fact. a record store. So tell me about the inspiration. It was, a, it, was a, it was a real visit, wasn't it, to a record store? Yes, I went to uh, a shop called Berrigan's Record that used to be on Claremont Avenue, not Telegraph Avenue, in Oakland. And uh, the first day that I walked into that store, it just so happened that there were two guys working in the store that day, and one was a black guy and one was a white guy. And there were a bunch of customers just hanging out, talking, leaning on the front counter. What, what I saw was a, a place, a space had been created, a small space, kind of dusty um, and fragrant with the odor of moldering record albums in which it didn't matter whether you were black or white or um, you know, where you came from, what part of the city you lived in or where you were going to after you left. All that mattered was do you love jazz? Do you love old records? Do you want to talk about music? And have you got a few minutes to spare? And, and that seemed like a magical place. And when you saw this record store and it sort of triggered something, was it a sense that that kind of safe place where people can talk and hang out and the background doesn't matter so much as the music they're listening to, that that sense was, that th was being threatened in some way or was being lost? Because there's a sense in the book, isn't there, that there is a threat coming and in the book it's about multi-corporations or whatever mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. is there a sense of that kind of combination and that harmony? Was yeah I mean it's always that kind of place is always threatened and is always being lost. I mean I think it's inherent it's inherent in you, the idea of utopia itself that it will either will not come to be or having come to be it will pass away again. You know the, that kind of it, I mean ultimately I think what you're talking about is reversing entropy you know, you, reversing the tendency of things toward disorganization and, and meaninglessness. And that is the overall tendency of everything. And so if you somehow, through some kind of combination of hard work and alchemy and luck, manage to create a space that reverses all of those trends, and, and it, it's, not gonna, it's never going to last a very long time. But isn't it also that what you might see in a record store, you're not seeing out on the streets, or you're not seeing in the political discourse? and then you're wondering, why not? And Where's the connection? Yeah, I mean, that would be one way to look at it, I suppose. You could also maybe turn around and, and look at the world outside and try to see more of that, try to see that sense of commonality reflected in the larger culture, too. It's, it, you're not required to take a negative view. How did O.J. Simpson help inspire the book? <laughs> well. The verdict and the response, the public televised response, let me hasten to, to add, to the announcement of the verdict in the O.J. Simpson trial, which, you know, is, as I'm sure a lot of people remember, was a lot of footage of black people of Los Angeles celebrating. What shocked me, or I should say the part of me that was most shocked, was the part of me that had grown up in Columbia, Maryland connected, feeling very connected to black people, part of, that black people were part of my world, that I was a part of their world, that I, I, black people were very visible to me in the sort of Ralph Ellison sense of visible and invisible. And what I realized watching those televised celebrations was how disconnected I had become, um, how invisible black people had become to me because suddenly there was this, this visibility that totally took me aback and, and I felt that if I were still connected, if I, if I had remained as connected, if I could have remained as connected, 
however outraged I might have been or, or disappointed by the verdict, I probably wouldn't have been surprised to see celebration because I would have known that feeling was already out there. But you've gone further in, in, in one of your pieces saying that you'd, you felt in a way that you'd become a racist. Oh, I, to me, I define, well, it, 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 as soon as you begin to, as soon as a class or group of people become invisible to you, you're a racist. I mean, there's, it, it, it's, there are other, there certainly would be a lot of other ways to define that word, and that word can encompass, encompass all kinds of other in, forms of inhumanity, but, I mean, but that's sufficient right there to me. There's a little cameo of um, Barack Obama at a fundraiser in 2004. Um, what do you think of him as a writer? What, oh, Obama? I think he's a very good writer, especially in his first book um, in particular. Uh, I re I've read both of his books. Um, there's actually a lot to admire in the second one too, although that was written much more obviously with the as kind of the self-conscious political uh, effort. Um, but I recognize that he thinks like a writer. Uh, I guess it, by which in part I mean he is, seems to be comfortable with ambiguity um, and he's nuanced and he sees the other side of things quite easily in a way that I think is part of your obligation, especially as a fiction writer, um, to sort of look outside of yourself and try to imagine what, it, what things look like from some completely different point of view. Um, that seems to be a habit of his. I think it's possibly a liability, it's, although it should be the greatest virtue a po politician can possess. I think in practice it, it's often a liability. I think perhaps he, um, you know, if he were more one-sided, if he were more com completely Less nuanced. Certain and less nuanced, you know, he, 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 it, it might serve him, I'm sorry to say, uh, a little more effectively to hammer at his opponents instead of trying to understand where they're coming from. I mean, aside from the politics, do you think that literally having, you know, a, a, a black guy or somebody who at least identifies himself as black with, 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 a, with a black wife and, mm -hmm. and children, in that position, speaking with power and authority, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that is recalibrating or adjusting some of the discussions and some of the conversation that you're talking, exploring in the book? Absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It was, it is, it was and continues to be a, an immensely powerful, significant, ineradicable change in the ways that Americans think about black people, black and white Americans think about black people. And, um, you know, that's not going to ever go away. Towards the end of the book, you mentioned this idea of a space where common sorrow could be drowned in common passion. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you felt, because that, that sounded like a bigger point you were almost making to me anyway, this idea that the national conversation being a broad conversation rather than it being fragmented either by race or by political mm -hmm. affiliation. Was that part of what you were trying to say? Absolutely. And I mean, I think we talked about Barack Obama before that the speech that he gave at the Democratic Convention in 2004, that's what it was about. It was about the commonality of Americans and trying to connect to that commonality and not only by naming it and identifying it himself, but by getting Americans to think about it and to recognize it um, instead of focusing, as is almost always exclusively the case on our differences and the ways in which we disagree and the things that don't unite us and the things that um, that we don't hold in common to, to, I mean, all that's just a way of looking at things, and it's no more valid than it, than it is to look at the things that do bind us, that do unite us, and that do hold us together. But that's what I thought was interesting about your book being set in 2004, but the music being from the pre pre previous time, because it seems to me that music did used to bind people Absolutely. in that way. But, you know, if you listen to your, uh, if you listen to an iPod, at your iPod and you've got your own playlist, that's not the same as everyone listening to the same radio station. Absolutely. And so that's why I thought it was quite interesting that in a way there is a nostalgic, elegiac sense about it because music doesn't bind people in the same way that it used to, does it? No, I mean, not at all. And, and, and you know, there used to be a lot less fragmentation in what was considered, say, the top 40 or... But there are other things going on, you know, that you don't necessarily want to ignore. So that, you know, YouTube, for example, and the way these videos come along and just catch on and like what's this Korean pop video, a Gagnum style, whatever it's called now, that just like it's ubiquitous. Everyone knows about it. We all share that and everyone has seen it at least once. And I mean, there, it's, it's not like we, it's things will, I think things will always come along um, that, that 
can bring people together, that give people a shared basis for experience. Um, they're just not necessarily the same things they used to be. It's not 70s soul, it's Korean pop now. Exactly. <laughs> or a video of Korean pop. Michael Shibon, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.